it's Johnny from Dicebreaker here. Now, if you're in any way familiar with the channel, you'll know we're quite fond of painting miniatures, and with good reason. Painting miniatures is one of my absolute favourite things to do. There's something oddly therapeutic about the whole process. Whether you end up using the models you're painting in an actual game, or just stick them on your shelf. But how exactly do you paint a miniature? What do you need to get started? How do you bring a model to life? And for crying out loud, what on earth is a wash? Thankfully, learning how to paint miniatures is relatively straightforward. It just takes a bit of time and patience. Now, I'm by no means an expert. I only started painting miniatures two or three years ago, and believe you me, I have next to no artistic talents ordinarily. But I do know enough to get you started, so without any further ado, here's a very basic guide to painting miniatures. Let's start at the very beginning. If you want to paint a model, the chances are you're going to have to build it first. Some models do come pre-built, like the D&D miniatures from WizKids, but more often than not, your very first interaction with a miniature is probably going to look something like this. This is a sprue. This is what models look like when they come out of the moulds. Following the instructions included in the box, you need to clip bits of your miniature out from the sprue and then put them together. For this, it's good to use plastic glue. Plastic glue actually melts the plastic it's applied to, meaning when you stick two pieces together, they form a really strong bond. That said, once that glue has completely dried, it is extremely difficult to separate the two pieces again. You're far more likely to hack the model to bits and ruin it entirely, in fact. With that in mind, when it comes to sticking a model down onto the base, I highly recommend that you use super glue. Super glue, unlike plastic glue, sticks stuff together by forming little gluey crystals between the two surfaces. Now, these crystals happen to be very brittle, so once you finish painting your model and you want to work on the base, you can simply and carefully snap it off and then work on the base without worrying about ruining your nice paint job. Now, that advice will keep you covered for about 90% of the models you're likely to come into contact with. Some models, however, are made of resin, not plastic. The main difference here is you need to use super glue all over. Plastic glue simply won't work. Here's an example of an unpainted resin model to give you an idea of what it looks like. Now, before you actually glue a resin model together, you're going to want to give it a quick wash in some warm, soapy water. No, I am not kidding. See, when manufacturers are producing resin models, they spray the moulds with something called a releasing agent. This is designed to help them get the model out of the mould at the end of the process. It's the same principle as greasing a cake tin before baking. Now, this releasing agent can prevent paint from sticking to your model, so in order to prevent it simply chipping off, it's a good idea to wash it to make sure you've got rid of every last bit of it. There's one last thing to watch out for while assembling your models, and that's mould lines. Mould lines are little seams left on the model from, surprise surprise, the moulding process. These can be removed using a special mould line remover, or, if you're very careful, a scalpel or a Stanley knife. The quite literal rule of thumb here is that if you can't feel the mould line with your thumb or a fingertip, it won't show up on the model when you come to paint it. This is an optional step and it can be quite time consuming, but it is worth the extra effort if you can be bothered. The next step in painting a model is giving it an undercoat, also referred to as priming. The reason we do this is that most model paints are in fact acrylics, and acrylics don't play very well with plastics. So again, in order to prevent your hard work from simply chipping off, it's essential to give your models an undercoat with a decent primer. The best colour primer to use really depends on the colour scheme you have in mind. For models with very rich or dark colours, black is a good bet, and for something more vibrant, white is a good idea. For this video I'm painting a Skaven bombardier, and they tend to be a bit sort of grim darky, so I'm going with a black undercoat. You can find primers that you paint on by hand, but by and large you're likely to be doing all of your priming with a spray can. Now if you search online you'll get a lot of options for model primers, and a lot of them will be really very expensive. Do not bother with these. To be honest with you, you can just go to a pound shop and pick up any old can for about 99p and it will do just the same job. The only important thing is to make sure that you've warmed it up in some warm water beforehand and you've given it a really good shake. 
excellent YouTube channel Luke's Affordable Paint Service has a fantastic video on this topic which you can find in the description of this one. The video explains the difference between cheap cans and expensive cans really well, spoilers there isn't any difference, and the same video also covers good technique for spraying a model. I thoroughly recommend you give it a go. Either way, you and your 99p spray can want to make sure the model has an even coat that isn't too thick. Most importantly though, spray your models outside and make sure you wear a ventilator mask. These cans are absolutely packed with carcinogenic material and I care about your safety. Gloves are also a good idea. Mine are pink. Once you've sprayed your miniature, give it around half an hour to 45 minutes to dry in a well-ventilated area before moving on to actually painting them. If you want to get really fancy with your priming, you could always try underpainting. This technique basically adds contrast to your models before you start putting colour on them, helping you build up a range of tonal values and a sense of light and dark from the very beginning. An excellent painter and YouTuber called Dana Howell has done a really great video on the basics of underpainting that explains it in much better detail than I ever could. A lot of the advice is geared toward airbrushes, but the principles are still well worth picking up. You can also find that video in the description of this one. Now there are plenty of ways to paint a miniature, but the most common method, and the one that is easiest to pick up when you're just starting out, follows five simple steps. Base colours, layering, shading, balancing, and highlights. Base colouring is pretty much exactly as it sounds. Using whatever colour scheme you've settled on, you want to start blocking in your colours. In other words, pick a bit of the model, decide what colour that bit is going to be, then paint it that colour. The goal of this step is to build up strong, even colours across the miniature without slapping the paint on too thick. If your paint is too thick or too heavily applied, you'll lose some of the details from the model itself and it simply won't look as good. The best way to build up strong colour without swamping your model is to apply your base layers in thin coats. Get a blob of paint on a palette and then dip the very tip of your brush in some water. Mix that water into the paint and you'll notice how the consistency changes. You want something that's smooth without being watery or runny. It should go smoothly onto the model without just running straight down it. As well as preserving the details of the model, thinning your paint also makes it much easier to control with the brush, meaning you're far less likely to make mistakes or get an uneven coat. Now, some paints, particularly lighter shades, tend to be more see-through than others, so in order to get a really solid, uniform colour, you might need as many as three coats, but for the most part, two thin coats is generally enough. Note that you don't need to worry too much about being messy at this stage, especially with the very first colour you're sticking on a model, because you can always tidy things up as you go. For this reason, this style is a good opportunity to experiment with different brush strokes and find a style that works for you. Now, when you paint a model, it's a good idea to adopt a nice stable pose that works for you. Some people like to hold the model close to the table and then bend down to it, but personally, I like to plant my elbows on the table, put my wrists together, and then cup the model like that. So when I've got a brush, it's nice and stable, and I can make small movements as I paint it. For extra stability, I take my little finger, very refined, and just balance it on the model itself. So I can really sort of grab my hand up, control my brush strokes, and go from there. Again, it's all about personal preference, so explore what works for you, but all in all, a more stable pose makes for much more accurate brush strokes and fewer mistakes overall. It's good to get into this habit early so you don't get frustrated and have to relearn it later on. Once you finish base coating your model, you should end up with something that has nice even colours. More often than not, you're also going to end up with something that doesn't look particularly exciting. Something very flat looking, something that has you wondering why you thought you could do this in the first place when you're clearly a failure and you'll never amount to anything. Do not worry. Base coating is a vital step, however it often looks flat and clunky and often just straight up bad. Hold your nerve and crack on and I promise you it'll look better later. The next step in our journey toward a completed model is layering. With layering, your goal is to break up the uniform colours you laid down in the previous stage, helping the details of the model stand out more and introducing some secondary colours. 
If you look at something like a leather belt, a curtain or a jacket in real life for instance, you'll notice it's rarely the same colour overall thanks to the light or the folds in the fabric or texture variations or simply because there's another colour in there. That's what this step is all about. If you thin your paints as you did in the previous step, you can control exactly how strong these layer colours are, letting some of the base colour come through underneath in order to create a subtle yet rich effect. As you can see here, I'm using a lighter flesh tone to build up the arms and the face of the Skaven, but I'm also using a couple of different metal shades, different from the base coat, in order to break up the metals a little bit. Now at first it may feel strange to be covering up so much of the painting you've just done, but try not to sweat it too much. The base colour will still show through in places and the overall effect, I promise you, is absolutely worth it. Be brave and experiment during this step and you'll soon get a feel for where you want your layer paints to go and how strong you want the layer colours to be. As a good starting guide though, look for bits of the model that naturally suggest a different colour. Raised areas are a good start for instance, especially on stuff like flesh. Once you're happy with what you've done, or near enough, it's time to move on to the next step, shading. Shading is where you add contrast to your model, heightening the difference between the light areas and the recessed darker areas, really tying the paint job together and bringing the model to life. Shades are also referred to as washes, but I refer to them as the make look good water because, well, they're very watery, but they can also completely transform a model. Now washes are basically really, really, really thinned down paint. When you apply a wash, it coats the model and starts to gather in all the recessed areas, all the nooks and crannies and dips, which serves to deepen the shadows, basically enhancing the contrast already created by the sculpt itself and by light hitting the model. I really cannot overstate how transformative this step can be when you are painting a model. As I've said before, blocking out the colours can leave you with something that feels a bit flat or lifeless and that can be discouraging, but then you suddenly shade a model and oh, okay, this suddenly looks like something you're excited to finish. Applying a wash is also pretty simple. You put some on a brush and you get it on the model, making sure it gets into all of those crevices and all of the bits that you want to shade. That said, it's important not to go overboard here. Applying too much can make it look like your model's been beaten up, or it can dry irregularly and leave unsightly lines that you may hear people refer to as tide marks. Avoiding that is fairly simple, just keep an eye on the model as you shade it and as it starts to dry. If it starts to pull toward the bottom, or if it collects too heavily in a nook, just use your brush to move it around a bit. You also want to think about what colour shade to use as well, as these can create really drastically different effects. Reddish shades, for example, as I'm using here, are useful for lighter flesh tones or for metals that perhaps look like they haven't really been looked after, as a Skaven's might. But of course, these are also very warm tones, so if that's something you want to avoid, you'd be better off with a black or even a blue wash. Again, it's all about experimenting and finding out which shades give you the effect you're looking for in the model. That experimentation also includes just how heavy you want to go with your washes, which leads neatly into our next step, balancing the shade. See, some washes, especially dark ones like Citadel's Nuln Oil, can leave your model looking very dark, very grimy and very poorly lit. And that's fine if that's the effect you're going for, and indeed there are plenty of cases in which I'd be very happy for the model to look all matte and murky. Sometimes, however, you don't want the whole thing to be really dark all over, especially if it serves to flatten out some of the areas you've just spent time building up with all your layer paints. Take this metal armour for instance, the shade has done a good job of adding contrast to the miniature, but we still want the armour to look bright when the light hits it. At this point you can go back in with the layer or even the base colours and give it a little touch up, just to dial back the shade and create a bit of extra contrast between the flat portions of the model and those recessed areas we hit with a wash earlier. So if you go back in and carefully add an extra layer of colour, again avoiding the bits where the shade has gathered, you'll end up with something that's more dynamic and more vibrant. The final stage, and in my opinion the most important one, 
is highlighting. Now in this step, you take little tiny details from the model and you pick them out with colors in order to really make them stand out while tying the model together. In other words, this is the stage in which you show off a bit. For this step, you need to return to the color palette you picked out when choosing your base colors, then pick some complementary colors. The idea when you're highlighting a model is to pick out the hard edges and elements of your model where the light would naturally hit it hardest. With this in mind, picking similar shades that are lighter than your base colors is a pretty good idea. If you want to get creative with it, your highlight color can be completely different to the base shade, especially if you're going for something like a cyberpunk effect, but most of the time you'll probably be working with similar colors. Either way, load up your brush with a little bit of paint and, as I mentioned earlier, pick out a few edges to paint with your chosen highlight color. The edges of a cloak are a good one, for instance, as are the edges of bits of armor and any rivets you might find on armor or weaponry. You can also pick out the nose, brows and cheekbones on a face or even give an extra white tip to teeth or fangs. Whatever makes sense to you, really. If you're stuck, have a look at some pictures online and see what other people have done. Now this is probably the trickiest step in painting a model because with it so close to being done, you really don't want to mess up the whole thing with a careless brush stroke. So go slowly and go carefully and also pause regularly to consider the model on the whole and think about whether it needs any more highlighting. Less is often more in this step, so be careful not to go overboard. And hopefully at this point you'll be left with a miniature you are pretty happy with. Obviously there'll be some bits that you think you could have done better or maybe bits you think didn't work as well as they did inside your head that you'd maybe do differently next time. And you know what? That's all fine. This is a hobby that, as I said before, is all about experimentation, practice and patience. So generally speaking, just be kind to yourself. So that is a very basic guide on how to paint miniatures. Hopefully you found it useful. I didn't talk about how to base a model because frankly we could talk about that all day, but I could well cover it in a future video if people fancy. Indeed, if you have any questions or if you're after any particular painting tips, or indeed if you have any tips of your own to share, I'd love to see them in the comments below. So again, hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, there are loads more from Dicebreaker for you to watch. Some of them should be on screen now. Do like, subscribe and ring the bell icon so you don't miss anything else from us. But most importantly, thank you very much for watching. Good luck and have a lovely day.